From gun-slinging outlaws to fearless pioneers, we're diving deep into the heart of the Wild West. These facts are so jaw-dropping, they'll make you rethink history. Let's get into it. Number 25. The California Gold Rush from 1849 wasn't America's first gold rush. In fact, it wasn't even the second one. In 1799, a young guy named Conrad Reed found a big yellow rock in his dad's field in North Carolina. Neither Conrad nor his dad knew what it was, so they used it as a doorstop. After a jeweler visited and realized it was a 17-pound gold nugget, people went crazy searching for more gold. The government even built a mint in Charlotte to deal with all the gold found in North Carolina. Then, in 1828, gold was discovered in Georgia, starting another gold rush. Finally, in 1848, a guy named James Marshall got rich finding gold in Sutter's Mill in California and lots of people headed west, hoping to get lucky too. Number 24. There were crazed cannibals that roamed Nevada. Back in the day in Nevada, the native tribes had this wild story about red-haired giants who were also cannibals. These giants used to freak out the local tribes big time thousands of years ago. The Northern Paiute tribe has been passing down these ancient tales about these giant troublemakers called the Cite Ka. According to the Paiute, these giants weren't just big, they were fiery-haired gingers with a taste for human flesh. Yeah, it's as scary and weird as it sounds. The Paiute folks say these cannibal giants got their fiery hair by chowing down on some special water plant. And get this, they used to go hunting people in the high deserts of the Old West Way before anyone from the East showed up. But hey, the Paiute put a stop to that madness ages ago. According to Sarah Winnemucca Hopkins, a Paiute activist, Paiute warriors managed to trap all the Cite Ka in a big dark cave. Then they went all out and set the entrance on fire. That was the end of the cannibals. Poof, gone, never heard from again. Number 23. Jamestown can take a back seat. Acoma Pueblo holds the title for the oldest settlement in the United States. You know how Native American settlements were around way before the Europeans showed up. Well, here's a cool fact. Acoma Pueblo, out west near Albuquerque, New Mexico, had been going strong since the 12th century. The Acoma folk still live in their Sky City, a community of around 4,800 people perched on a 365-foot-high mesa. Back in the day, they were hunters and traders, but now they make a living with a cultural center and a casino. Oh, and speaking of old stuff, Santa Fe takes the cake for being the oldest state capital in the United States. It just hit its 400th anniversary. Cool, right? Number 22. Sleeping in Bug-Filled Straw Beds Can you believe having a bed made of straw and hay without a bed frame was a thing back in the day? Comfort wasn't a big deal compared to sleeping on the floor, but keeping things clean was a bit tricky. Sadly, changing the straw regularly wasn't really doable, and that caused problems with bugs and lice. Warm straw turned out to be the perfect spot for certain insects. Yikes! Number 21. Millions of bison were slaughtered. Back in the early 1800s, America was like Bison Central, with estimates saying there were millions, somewhere between 10 and 30 million of these guys. Fast forward to the early 1900s and BAM! There were less than a thousand left. So what happened? Turns out, American buffalo were wiped out big time. The U.S. Army and its hired guns went on a shooting spree, and by 1830, they were on a mission to erase these buffaloes that were a major food and hide source for Native Americans. One colonel even said, Kill every buffalo you can. Every buffalo dead is a Indian gone. Even Buffalo Bill Cody got in on it, taking down 4,000 bison in just two years. 
In 1889, the buffalo count hit rock bottom with a measly 256 in captivity. But hey, today we've managed to bounce back a bit with a buffalo population of 150,000 to 200,000. Number 20. Feral Camels Once Roamed the Plains of Texas Back in 1856, someone had this wild idea called the U.S. Camel Corps, set up in Texas at Camp Verde. They thought the dry southwest was like Egypt, so they brought in 66 camels from the Middle East. Now these camels weren't exactly model soldiers. They spat, regurgitated, and didn't follow orders too well. But weirdly enough, the experiment kind of worked. Then the Civil War hit, and the frontier exploration got put on hold. The Confederates swooped in and captured Camp Verde. After the war, most of the camels were sold off. Some even ended up in Ringling Brothers Circus, and a few made a run for it into the wild. The last wild camel sighting in Texas was in 1941, and we're guessing none of the Camel Corps' descendants are still kicking around today. Number 19. The Mines Alright, so remember the story about the Camel Red Ghost? Well, turns out it might be more fiction than fact, but it's not the only crazy tale from the Wild West. There are tons of stories about weird, spooky, and just plain unbelievable stuff. But the ones that really stick are all about lost mines and hidden fortunes. Back when the West was getting settled, there were these gold and silver rushes that brought folks from the East. Thousands of guys, young and not so young, feeling lucky, crazy, or just bored, headed West for a shot at a new life. Most of them didn't strike gold and went broke real quick. But those lucky few who hit the jackpot got someone else dreaming about their own big break. And that's when the story started flying. Talks about lost mines, secret treasures, and hidden loot. People said the miners stashed away their riches to keep them safe from sneaky thieves. And according to the stories, that gold is still out there, waiting for someone to stumble upon it. Number 18. The first film cowboy wasn't a cowboy at all. Meet Bronco Billy Anderson, the guy often called the father of Western films. Born Maxwell Henry Arison in 1880, he was the son of a traveling salesman from Arkansas. As soon as Arison could, he booked it to New York City, where he got involved in making a ton of movies, literally hundreds of them. By luck, he got cast in The Great Train Robbery in 1903. Seeing its success, Aronson thought, why not roll with it? So he created the character Bronco Billy and went on to write and star in loads of short Western films. And just like that, he became the first cowboy matinee idol. Number 17. Toilet paper wasn't popular until the mid-1800s. Back in the day, before we got the cozy toilets inside our homes, they were basically these outdoor sheds, covering a hole in the ground. If you've been to a carnival, live show, or just camping, you can picture how not so nice it must have been. The worst part? Those special smells and the bugs. Total yuck. And it gets even less pleasant. Those shared outdoor toilets weren't just unsanitary. They were like bug central. Plus, imagine this. Before toilet paper was a thing in the West, which didn't happen until the mid-1800s, people used leaves, corn cobs, and grass. Talk about adding to the mess! Number 16. The Long Branch Saloon, famous from Gunsmoke, really did exist in Dodge City. And guess what? It's still around. Well, sort of. If you grew up watching Gunsmoke, you probably remember Miss Kitty's Long Branch Saloon in Dodge City, Kansas. Well, it turns out the Long Branch was no TV fantasy. It actually existed. Although the exact founding year is a mystery, the original saloon burned down in the Big Front Street Fire of 1885. But fear not, it got a second chance and now stands as a tourist spot with a recreated bar and live entertainment. According to the Boot Hill Museum, the original Long Branch Saloon served up a mix of drinks, from milk and tea to lemonade, sarsaparilla, alcohol, and beer. Imagine Marshal Matt Dillon and Festus with milk mustaches. 
Now that would be a storyline. Number 15. The Crazy Crash at Crush William Crush, a railroad executive known for his flair for the dramatic, sought to generate enthusiasm for rail travel in the late 19th century America. In 1894, he sought funding for the Missouri-Kansas-Texas Railroad Company, commonly known as the Katy. To garner attention and support, Crush organized an extravagant carnival in a temporary Texas town named after himself. The highlight of the event was a spectacle in which two 35-ton train engines collided to showcase the railway's power. Despite the tragic outcome, resulting in the deaths of two individuals and injuries to hundreds, the event was deemed a financial success. Crush had temporarily turned the location into the second largest city in Texas, attracting over 40,000 spectators. The collision, featuring steam-powered trains hurtling towards each other at speeds exceeding 50 miles per hour, resulted in a spectacular explosion of steam, fire, and train debris. While the tragic incident swayed thousands towards recognizing the might of the railroad, Crush's supervisors were appalled by his actions. Subsequently, Crush was dismissed from his position after the railroad overseers learned of the deadly collision. Number 14. Elmer McCurdy's corpse had more fun than he did. There's this guy named Elmer McCurdy. He was only 31 when he got shot by the cops in 1911 after trying to rob a train in Oklahoma. Talk about wildlife! Turns out he and his buddies messed up big time and only scored 46 bucks from the train, thinking it was loaded with cash. Now, here's where it gets crazy. After McCurdy got himself killed, the sheriff decided to make a quick buck and sold his body to a carnival owner. Yep, you heard it right. They mummified him and turned him into a sideshow attraction. Imagine going to a carnival and seeing the outlaw who would never be captured alive. Or later on, they switched it up to show him as some kind of dope fiend. But the weirdest part? McCurdy's body just kept moving around, from a warehouse to a wax museum, and then it somehow ended up in a funhouse exhibit at an amusement park in California. Fast forward to 1976. The crew filming the $6 million man stumbled upon him, and guess what? His arm popped off like no big deal, covered in wax and paint. Finally, in 1977, they decided it was time to give McCurdy a proper rest. They brought him back to Guthrie, Oklahoma, and buried him, a whopping 66 years after he bit the dust. Talk about a crazy journey from train robber to carnival star to a Hollywood set and finally a quiet grave in Oklahoma. Number 13. The Old West Soap Nowadays, picking a soap is like choosing a Netflix show. So many options. A Vino, Dial, Dove, Olay. It's a soap opera of brands for body and hand wash. You feel me? Back in the day, they didn't have this crazy selection. But that doesn't mean they were soap deprived. Nope, they had the basics down. Animal fat, lye, water, and a sprinkle of herbs for that extra oomph. Keeping it simple, you know. And get this, down in the Southwest, they put a plant called soap plant, or fancy schmancy Corrigalum pomeridianum, also known as a mole. It was like their sudsy secret ingredient, making those soaps lathery and smelly, all herbally fresh. Who knew nature was in the soap game way back when? Number 12. Dead outlaws were propped up and photographed. Back in the day, newspapers loved to spill the tea on gang adventures and outlaw shenanigans, with a bit of exaggeration in the books, of course. When these troublemakers went out in a bang, folks in town were like, show us the receipts! And the authorities? They were all about putting on a show to scare off any wannabe outlaws. Then, bam! Photography swooped in during the early 1800s like, hey, I got this! Now, instead of just talking, they could snap pics of the outlaw crew, sometimes all bunched up, other times just a duo casually propped together. It was like a morbid photo shoot right before they got the six feet under treatment. 
Talk about capturing the not-so-glamorous side of the Wild West. Number 11. Billy the Kid wasn't left-handed. And we found out thanks to the Winchester rifle. So there's this old picture of Billy the Kid. You know, the famous outlaw. In the photo, he's got his gun belt on his left side. And people used to think he was left-handed because of it. But here's the twist. Those old cameras back then made everything look opposite. So it turns out he was actually a righty. We figured this out because in the same pic, he's holding a Winchester rifle. And the loading thing on it is on the left side. But guess what? Winchester rifles of that type only loaded on the right. So much for assuming, right? Number 10. Gamblers put modern wagering to shame. Gambling's been a big deal in American life for ages, from the constant buzz of Las Vegas to the boom of online sports betting lately. The Old West was no different. Heading out west was a gamble in itself. Pioneers were pretty much betting their lives with all the dangers they faced. Making it out there meant you were lucky already. So, when folks arrived, playing cards to pass time and earn a bit to get by just made sense. Gambling was so normal back then that it was as respected as being a doctor or a lawyer. Some historians even say it was considered a legit job just like being in the clergy or medicine. All over the West, big games with the chance of big wins drew in the serious gamblers. These guys would travel from town to town, making cash at the card tables. But not all of them played fair. Some cheated to win against the locals and then hightailed it out of town with their loot before anyone could catch on. Number 9. America's First Serial Killer Family Emerged when you think of the Wild West, you probably picture cowboys and bandits. But there were also some pretty notorious serial killers around, like the Bender family. They were this creepy bunch of German immigrants who set up in Labette County, Kansas for just a year between 1871 and 1872. Their place was this odd mix of a general store and a little inn for travelers, complete with a barn, corral, and a well on the property. The Benders, or the Bloody Benders as they were known, weren't exactly the friendliest folks in town. People thought they were weird, mean, or just kind of off. Four of them lived there, John Bender Sr. and his wife Elvira, their son John Jr. and his girlfriend Kate, who might have actually been his sister. It turns out this family was up to some really dark stuff. They're believed to have knocked off at least 11 people, burying the poor souls in their orchard. As whispers started spreading about all these missing people and suspicion began to point their way, the Bender family just up and disappeared, leaving behind their grim legacy and a whole lot of questions. Number 8. The famous gunfight at the OK Corral was actually not much of a shootout, and surprisingly, it didn't even happen at the OK Corral. So you know that super famous Old West shootout with the Earp brothers, Morgan, Virgil, and Wyatt, their buddy Doc Holliday, Billy Claiborne, the Clanton brothers, Billy and Ike, and the McClowry brothers, Frank and Tom? Turns out it wasn't as epic as it's made out to be. Despite eight guys being involved, the whole thing was over in just about 30 seconds. And get this, it didn't even happen at the OK Corral like everyone thinks. The actual spot where all the action went down was near the corner of 3rd Street and Fremont Street in Tombstone, Arizona, which is actually behind the corral. But even though it was short, it was pretty intense. Three of the lawmen ended up hurt, and three of the cowboys didn't make it out alive. So, it might not have been a long, drawn-out battle, but it sure was deadly. Number 7. The West Wild Whiskey Woes Out in the frontier, besides a good game of cards, whiskey was the go-to drink for many. But let me tell you, the kinds of whiskey they had back then are nothing like what we'd want to sip on today. They had some wild names for their drinks, like 40 Rods, Tarantula Juice, Taos Lightning, Sounds exotic, right? But these drinks were insanely strong, packed with some pretty crazy stuff. We're talking about actual poisons like strychnine and other wild ingredients like turpentine and tobacco oil. Drinking this stuff was an adventure in itself. 
Often people needed a second shot just to wash down the first one, if they could handle it without losing their lunch. A few rounds in and they'd be so knocked out they'd forget the harsh taste and end up in a booze-fueled nap, only to wake up and do it all over again. When you think about it, it's not that surprising. Saloons were scarce, towns were miles apart, and getting supplies was a hit or miss. Plus, there were no rules or regulations for food and drink out west in the 19th century. No one was telling the saloon owners what should or shouldn't go into their whiskey. So they just mixed up whatever they had or whatever they thought would sell. Creative? Sure. Safe? Definitely not. Number 6. The deadliest outlaw was probably John Wesley Hardin. John Wesley Hardin, a guy from Bonham, Texas, started stirring up trouble real young. At just 14, he almost killed another kid with a knife. By 15, he had shot his uncle's slave and then took out three soldiers who came after him. In his autobiography, Hardin claimed he took down 44 men, but honestly, that book's full of wild stories that are hard to prove. Still, it's believed he might have killed around 15 to 30 people. His life pretty much seemed like a series of murders, one after the other. While in Abilene, Kansas, he bumped into Wild Bill Hickok, the local marshal. They somehow got on all right, maybe because Hickok either didn't know or didn't care that Hardin was wanted for murder back in Texas. But things got real messy on August 6, 1871. Hardin, drunk and annoyed by a guy snoring too loud in the next hotel room, shot through the wall. It's not clear if he meant to kill the guy, but that's exactly what happened. People started saying Hardin was so mean he'd shoot a man just for snoring. After that, Hardin skipped town, dodging Hickok and the law until 1875. That's when he got caught and tried for killing a well-liked sheriff in Comanche, Texas. He was just 21 and he got a 25-year sentence, but ended up serving only 17 years before somehow getting pardoned in 1894. His luck ran out a year later. A guy he had argued with earlier that day shot him in the back of the head while he was playing dice, and then shot him a few more times just to make sure. Number 5. Jesse James was larger than life, so much that his body required two graves. Jesse James was one of those outlaws whose name everyone knew while he was still stirring up trouble. After his bank robbing days, he settled down for a quieter life in Kearney, Missouri, but he was never really forgotten neither by friends nor foes. When Jesse was killed, his family buried him right in the front yard of his farm to keep grave robbers at bay. As time went on and his enemies passed away, his family moved him to a cemetery in Kearney. But here's where it gets weird. There's this grave in Granbury, Texas, claiming to be Jesse James. So, who's buried there? Well, it's a guy named J. Frank Dalton. Around 1948, when he was 101, Dalton popped up saying he was the real Jesse James. He even got a court to let him legally take Jesse's name. Why Dalton made this claim, or if he had any real connection to Jesse James, is still a mystery. Fast forward a few decades, and mitochondrial DNA testing proved that Jesse James is indeed resting in Mount Olivet Cemetery in Kearney. But despite the science, Jesse's legend still has a place in Granbury. It's one of those wild tales that just adds to the mystique of the Old West. Number 4. Chewing Tobacco Was Quite Nasty Back in the old days, there was a pretty practical reason why so many people were into chewing tobacco, aside from the fact that it's super addictive. When you're out there in the hot, dry, and dusty fields, chewing tobacco helps keep your mouth moist. That bit of saliva it generates? Kind of a relief when you're dealing with all that dust and heat. In the 19th century, when chewing tobacco was really popular, you'd find these bowls called spittoons in most saloons. They weren't just in bars, though. You'd see them in stores, pubs, and even banks. These spittoons were where everyone spat out their used tobacco. Imagine a bowl full of chewed up tobacco. Not exactly a pretty sight. But back then, it was just part of the scene. As common as seeing a beer glass on the bar. Number 3. One pivotal Civil War battle was fought 
in an unlikely place, New Mexico. So here's a wild place of history. Confederate General Henry Hopkins Sibley had his big idea to grab some gold from Cripple Creek to fill up the rebels' war chest. In early 1862, he thought he could just waltz into New Mexico territory from the south, march up the Rio Grande, and even take over Colorado. But what he didn't know was that the 1st Regiment of Volunteers in Colorado got wind of his plan. These guys hustled 400 miles south in just 13 days, all to join forces with the Union soldiers at Fort Union near Santa Fe. Sibley was probably expecting an easy win, but boy was he wrong. Historians often call this showdown the Gettysburg of the West. It turned into a two-day scrap, and the Union troops, likely with some help from local ranchers who knew the lay of the land, managed to sneak around the Confederates and torch their supply train. After that, the Confederate troops had no choice but to trudge back to Texas, beaten and never to come back again. Number 2. Dining like in the Old West might sound appealing, but it's likely not as enjoyable as you'd think. Honestly, it's not a shocker that food in the Wild West wasn't exactly good. For breakfast, you'd get the best of the bunch. Think cornbread, stew, boiled eggs, fried potatoes, and omelets. Not too shabby, right? But dinner was a whole other story. We're talking about stuff like calves head, boiled mutton, or get this, soused calves feet. And for dessert, pudding. Yep, that was a typical dinner for a frontier family around 1853. The way they cooked was super basic. Ovens, frying pans, and roasting spits were the go-to. And the menu pretty much depended on whatever meat or vegetables were around at that time of year. Cowboys, on the other hand, had it simpler. Canned beans, rock-hard biscuits, dried meat, dried fruit, and coffee. But if you're into trying out some old-timey food while soaking up the history, there's a cool spot, the Buckhorn Saloon and Museum in San Antonio, Texas. It's like a little taste of the Wild West, but with food you actually want to eat. Number 1. Dodge City was extremely violent. So, you know how movies and TV shows make the Wild West look like it's all shootouts and showdowns? Well, it wasn't exactly that wild, but it definitely wasn't a peaceful paradise either. Take Dodge City in Kansas, for example. It got this reputation as one of the roughest spots back then. In Dodge City, the murder rate was about 0.165 annually, which means around 165 adults were killed per 100,000 people. To put it another way, if you lived in Dodge City from 1876 to 1885, you had about a 1 in 61 chance of getting murdered. Pretty intense, right? Now, if we jump to 2020, the most violent city was Los Cabos, Mexico, with a murder rate of 138 per 100,000 people. It's wild to think that back in the day, Dodge City was even more dangerous than that. Just goes to show you the Wild West had its fair share of danger, even if it wasn't all like in the movies. We've just taken a wild ride through 25 old Wild West facts that might just have you looking over your shoulder. I hope you found these amazing historical nuggets as fascinating and spine-tingling as a moonlit standoff. Alright, that's it for today. Thanks for watching. See you in the next video.